So we've all heard the phrase, you know, any given Sunday. Uh, another big challenge that data scientists face when, when solving business problems is adapting to data that changes over time. Similarly, in sports, the, the nature of the game and player performances within it are constantly evolving. So how do you adapt your models to maintain relevance and accuracy? Yeah. Um, it's a good point. New sources of data or new rules are the only things that really require modification. Um, so I was constantly evaluating new sources of data. As I mentioned, I, we didn't change that too much. Um, there were we started to get information at a at a at a faster rate, but that was incredibly helpful. You know, real time, truly real time information from sporting events. Um, but um, we rarely changed the data itself. Rule changes are really the only thing that I had to worry about, because if you think about it, a simulation model is is a is a is a series of probabilities. Even within one NFL play, uh, and this is a little bit more applicable to one of sports, but uh, because of exactly how it was built, but we might draw 200 random variables because it's what's the probability, what's the probability distribution of this happen, you know, run or pass, draw a random variable, random number, which direction does it go? Is it, you know, this play, this play, this play, this play? When thinking about all that, the only the inputs um, obviously matter. But as soon as the simulation model starts, the inputs are done. You know, what in by this I mean inputs is like what is a player, who are the players involved, what are expectations, if this player gets hurt, which we can simulate, what happens? All of that has to be figured out beforehand. The model itself then just needs to know what's possible. And so the only real things we ever had to do with changing a model is accounting for rule changes. If literally something changed around what's possible. Otherwise, any time that the game evolved, that would come through the probabilities. Now, we lagged then a little bit. But in sports, because you have so many games played so quickly, you have this immediacy of understanding what how um, of understanding what's happening, the sheer sample size can mean that if you're if you're lagging, you don't lag for very long. Because if the game changes, the model picks it up. Unless again, it's a rule change or a totally new data set. So then let me maybe ask it a different question, but that's related. So let's take like a Trent Richardson, for example, who was you know amazing at Alabama and then he crushed it his first uh, his rookie season at the Browns. But then I think the Colts traded for him and his performance dropped significantly. So how do you account for not just the player, but but the team and the system that surrounds them? Yeah, um, that's interesting, too. Uh, quick aside, that was right around the time that you and I started talking to each other. Um, and we were doing some work with Mike Holmgren, who was the president, I think, of the Browns technically at the time. And he had been a general manager and a head coach. And he told us definitively that they that the Colts or excuse me, that the Browns uh, were not going to draft Trent Richardson at number four, um, which was interesting because then they traded up and drafted him at number three. <laughs> Um, uh, we were we were telling him at the time that you know the running back wasn't necessarily worth it at that high of a pick. But we were we did think Trent Richardson would be very good. Um, when I would go into when the simulation engine as an input, we've talked a lot about like the fact that we need to remove bias. We've talked about changing data sets. I haven't really talked yet about how we really thought about this. Um, we what I added into the system is. What is every individual player? So this is this is you know by position to some degree, but what is the individual player's expectations on a per play basis? This is every sport. If he were on an average team with completely average teammates, so league average coach, league average teammates, league average opponent, neutral field, no weather. And if you do that, if you really understand individually who that player is then you can build the team of in the sport in, in football 10 other guys who we each know individually who they are and put them together to see what happens once they actually are charged with doing something and so that means that the coaching and coach not just the other 10 players the coaches the weather the opponents ever what it really means is yeah 
this player may be good. And really, in honesty, a 90th percentile running back is going to average a half yard, maybe at most, more per run than a 20th percentile or 10th percentile, some sort of lower, very low percent running back. Which matters, but not a ton, especially given how hurt they can be or how they how quickly they can wear down. Um, and most of that, just to clarify, most of that is either a reduction in negative plays or explosive plays. Running backs, it's just a bit of a aside, running backs have a very consistent like probability of gaining one to five yards. The ones that are really good tend to have more 20 yard runs and the ones that are really bad tend to have more negative runs. But thinking about that example still, that means that Trent Richardson, if he was very good, we probably didn't have him quite that good, but if he was very good, could potentially gain an extra half yard on a per run basis if he were with a totally average team. Put him behind a below average team and that impact gets mitigated and potentially completely countered if it's a really bad team, especially if all 10 other guys around him are poor. Um, and scheme matters. A lot of what we had to do for NFL, more so than any other sport, is figure out like what's the aggressiveness, what's the run pass mix, what's the scenario, you know, how how does a coach handle these various scenarios? All of that ultimately matters when we're trying to project what's going to happen. Um, even if the player doesn't change, his outcome then can change dramatically. With Trent, it was a combination of a couple of things. <laughs> The team for sure, which is more what your question is, but also, you know, injuries and or just wear and tear, it looked like, you know, had caught caught up with him much faster than it usually does with even other running backs. So, and you were just talking this, that there's inherent randomness in sports. So then how do you account for and predict things like, like injuries or other factors that could lead to a stark decline in performance? Like here, if we think about like an RG3, he briefly briefly played at, you know, a God tier level, yeah. got injured, and then was very average for the rest of his career. And, the, you know, same story with a guy like Peyton Hillis. Yeah, it crushes me that people think that RG3 was a bust. He was, he's actually, I think he's a top three all-time uh, quarterback that I've evaluated for the draft, which only goes back to 20. But it started that way, right? Yeah. It's just after and, but his first so year, he willed his team to the playoffs and then had the, his first major, his first major injury in the NFL. He had already had a major injury in college football. Uh, Baylor, uh, his first major injury in the NFL was during the playoff game. Um, it's interesting. It's very difficult. It's almost impossible to understand how a player is going to bounce back. It's, it's, it, I, that's an incredibly difficult problem to have to solve. For me, and I alluded to this, and this is true for again for all industries, for all predictive analytics problems, uh, predictive analytics problems, data science problems. The most difficult thing to me by far is to try to ascertain truth, because you know history, and we know recency, and we know um, sample size. And we know you can even fit things to expectations on an evolution curve. I always try to figure out, based off both experience and age, what a player would like. What's an arc? You know, those, and those kind of arcs are different, but you, they, they both play a role in trying to suit, trying to figure out what the play, who that player is. So, I said a very simple thing like I need to know what a player looks like on a per play basis in a totally average environment. You know, team, opponent, weather referees etc that sounds it's easy to say it's incredibly difficult to figure out and so with players like rg3 or peyton hillis and there's unfortunately countless and in, in of them mostly or m many of them in football um baseball is another sport especially in pitching where that you can see this um we have a certain general baseline expectation for a bounce back that's less than what they were but it's like it's like multiplying point to something, you know, which is a joke, um, common joke in the data science world. Like if you don't know, but you know it needs a change, like give it a twenty percent discount and see where it goes from there. You don't know. And I'm not saying that's exactly what we did, but in some cases it probably is what we did because <laughs> you don't know, but you know it's less, and then you figure it out as soon as they come in. And um, model we we fortunately built the models in a way that if there was a gap or if the performance was dramatically different than what our expectations were, the inputs for that player would react much quicker. 
I believe like Jason Pierre Paul only played a, a couple of years of college ball before being drafted and, and then became one of the, the premier defensive ends, right? But then on the other side of it, you have a guy like Margus Hunt, who was an Olympic gold medalist that was far more athletic than JPP. I mean, we're talking, you know, 6'8, 275, 4, 6, 40, 38 reps on the bench press and a vertical that was a half a foot more than the the average NBA player. But he just couldn't crack the nut, right? So my question then is, how do you go beyond that data? Uh, not even just thinking injuries here, but you know, how do you go beyond the data and also factor the human element into your models? And how do you make projections about individual players when there's not a lot of data on them? Good question. <laughs> um, I just kind of I alluded to it a little bit in the last answer that. You know, the, the lower the sample size in general, the more each new observation impacts the expectations. That's true-ish. It's definitely true. But you have to start with a general baseline assumption of who anybody is. And the tricky part with both of those examples is neither of them were really likely to succeed in the NFL because neither of them play. Well, sorry. Neither of them were likely to, to become like elite level. Not because of their lack of athleticism, but because of their lack of experience. And so one of the things that fascinates me that I have not solved for ever is take that example and apply it to Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid, similar story, two years of pre-college basketball before he got to Kansas. Pretty good at Kansas, but not elite. And some people, I heard people saying, this guy's going to be one of the greatest players in the league in a few years. And he just won an MVP, drafted third overall by the Sixers. And it's so confusing. And he and he had injuries right off the bat in his career. And it's really confusing to me because I have a hard time understanding what led people to think that. But probability tends to win in these cases. So while that's interesting to me, the... The, the there that's an exception to the rule. The overwhelming expectation for somebody who has never proven it is that they won't do it at the next level. And let's I'm going to make up a number, so, which I hate doing because I'm nerd uh, and I'm all about actual probability. But let's say one of the things I do love about this job is understanding the unli unlikely scenarios or this career, understanding just how unlikely a scenario was. I root for the 16 to beat the one, not so I could be wrong, but because I know that that 16 in a dense deadly tournament might have a one in 10,000 chance to win. And if it pulls that off, it hit its 1,000 10,000 chance to win. And it's similar in these scenarios. For every Jason Pierre Paul, there's been an Ezekiel Ansa or Marcus Hunt. Ezekiel Ansa, almost identical story to Jason Pierre Paul. Athletic freak, two years of football, one big season. Drafted sixth overall, I forget where Pierre Paul was, like 12th or 13th or something. Um, and Ansa didn't make it. And the tools are tantalizing. But I would much prefer to bet on something, someone who's proven it at the next highest level when bringing somebody on to the, the highest level. Because that probability at least suggests that wins out far more often. Gotcha, gotcha. So and, and you worked on multiple sports, as you mentioned, I, and I recall, obviously, and, and mentioned earlier that you taught bracketology at, at the University of Cincinnati. How did your approach to modeling change based on the sport, or was it similar? The approach was the same. It's all simulation-based. It was all what are all the possible things that could happen on a per-play basis, which for hockey and soccer is a little bit different. We kind of thought about it per possession, if you will. Um, but on a, a per play basis, what are all the things that could happen? Who are all the players involved and what impact do they have on the play? Like that. And I wrote V1 of our baseball, basketball, and football models in between December 5th and January 28th of 09, 2010. Um, and so I flew through them. But that's because they were all, it was, and I hate to say this now, and the people from my data team can come at me if they want to, but it was all in Excel. Me, well, my portion. Then my brother adapted it into C sharp proprietary C sharp, sharp code. But I literally had the same template for every single sport. 
like started with the same tab structure, same template, same RAND function that we used all over the place. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, in simulation, you don't have to run a whole lot of testing to understand whether you're doing it right. You just need to know that you're accounting for everything that could occur. And so that was, you know, a set kind of firm approach. Um, since then, in the consulting world, there's definitely been times when you know, neural net black box modeling versus like a little bit more explainable, cleaner regression absolutely matters, especially in when you have to then take you know output and explain it. If the why matters more than the accuracy, which it did in the sports world, but it does oftentimes in the business world, um, modeling there's different ways in which you can approach modeling and i've used you know it was all simulation for me for for almost 20 years now it's pretty much any model you've ever heard of we've probably taken a stab at either, either in the uh consulting world or in and i'm sure you're in a similar boat but a consulting world or in the insurance world now so you're one of the the pioneers, obviously, in sports analytics. How have you seen this field evolve over the years, and and what do you see as the the next frontier? Yeah, I'm really curious. Uh, and I think the sports analytics applied to like biometrics and helping players get the most people get the most out of their physical capabilities is something I'm fascinated with. It's not something that I do much with, but I'm I, it's the it's the next evolution. A lot of it's already happening, but it's the next evolution. Um, I actually think initially, I, th I think that I think we've gone a little too far in some ways, and I'll explain this. Um, initially, some teams did really good at, at using data science, essentially, or analytics to identify exploitable opportunities. That's what Moneyball is about. Find, find inefficiencies in conventional wisdom, exploit a market. Um, and there are some teams, Tampa Bay Rays being the most uh, um, compelling example, that still really have that figured out. Um, like, but what's interesting is it went from a few teams doing it to um, let's talk baseball because best example because it's the most it's one that's evolved the most. A few teams had it and could use it. Then every team had somebody, but nobody really, but like very few of them still knew what they were doing. That, and and every and I've never understood why people um, I, I would talk to teams, they'd be like, oh, we already have like 12 guys in data science. I'm like, then why aren't you crushing if if that's the measure, then why aren't you crushing the people of three people in data science? You can't measure this by people. It's by how, what are you doing with the information? It's the so what. Um, but you know, departments got bigger, which I thought was silly. I didn't think there were that many problems to solve. Um, and, and the investment became something you kind of had to do, even if even if not everybody was using it right. Um, and then baseball got to has has gotten to a really interesting point where there's like so much ubiquity around the idea of like a wins above replacement concept that the market has no creativity in it. Uh, or very little. I mentioned the Rays still being good at exploiting things. I think the Reds have done a great job of being good game theorists. Um, and what I mean by all that is because of the advancement of you know analytics, the value of a player on paper has become something that just everybody can calculate to the exact same value, which or everybody does. Not that they can, and that's ridiculous to me because players mean completely different things to different teams. I, I worked with a, a player and an agent several years ago who had a, was really bad at giving up home runs, but very good otherwise. Um, flyball pitcher, obviously. So, like, you go to Colorado and his numbers look terrible. You go to San Diego where there, you know, there's uh, a larger park and there's suppression of of kind of the um, density of the air and it's he's one of the greatest he's a Cy Young winner and it's so interesting to me though so so I guess my point is like I think everybody gets with save for the biometric stuff which is where we're headed and save for the fact that people are now using the um, telematics I still think we got to a point where like most teams in most sports so this is not true of all sports 
kind of checked a box. And as long as they're coming up with all the same answers that everybody else is, they're comfortable with what they're doing in analytics. Whereas it takes creativity and understanding and identifying market inefficiencies, however that needs to be solved or addressed, to really take that what you're doing in the data science, data analytics world and apply it appropriately. So you've you've now transitioned back into the business world, as I mentioned, and, and you're working with again a, no, a notable insure yep. tech in Coterie, which I want to get back to in just a moment. But are you still doing any sort of sports analytics work on the side? A little bit. Um, so one of my favorite weeks of my life uh, in and this is soon after I'd sold Prediction Machine. Um, the Tommy Tuberville, who is the University of Cincinnati head football coach, um, up until um, right around the time that I'm, I'm alluding to, um, was going to resign or resigned on a Sunday. And, and the reason I'm telling this part of the story is the athletic director and chief of staff, Brandon Sosna, who's now with the Detroit Lions, actually, um, Mike Bone, who had been at UC and was then at USC, called me up the night before I resigned and said, we've got 10 guys for you. And you evaluate the, what the next four years of each of these coaches would look like. Um, Luke Fickle was not on that list. Neither was, uh, um, well, there were a lot of people omitted from the list. And a lot of people on the list made sense. And three of them were hired in the 12 hours from when, when, they, when I talked to those guys. And when I woke up the next morning, the actual press conference actually happened. Um, and I got to be a part of identifying how good University of Cincinnati football would be under all these different circumstances. We did ultimately do Luke Fickle analysis. He came out as the number one, actually, uh, prospect uh, for us to hire of those that had been hired by somebody else by the time we got to the analysis. Um, we brought him on board, and he outperformed expectations. Since then, I've done a few of those things. So I helped with the Lincoln Riley uh, when he was hired at USC just a year and a half ago, um, that was a blast because it's one thing to look at a bunch of defensive coordinators and offensive co coordinators, uh, which is what we generally did with UC. Um, when you're at USC, uh, the world's your oyster. We got to evaluate basically everybody <laughs> that could potentially like be a head football coach. Um, and that was really interesting. Fickle was actually performed really well on that one as well. Um, but Lincoln Riley was our top choice by far. We got him. So I've, I've done a few of those things, stayed connected that way. It's a, that's fun because like, you don't, I don't have to watch, I don't have to predict something and then immediately go watch that game to see if what I thought would happen would happen. Like this is a long, this is the long game when it, when it comes to that kind of thing. And I, I really enjoy staying a, a part of it, uh, to that's do cool. stuff like that. That's cool. So then how did the background in sports lead? And I, and I know you started in insurance, but, yep. you know, how are you at where you are now with, with Coterie? And, and what similarity do you see between the sports world and the insurance uh, beyond, you know, whatever you've yeah. already talked about? Yeah, I think I've talked about most of the similarities, but I'll talk a little bit about the story. Um, David McFarland, as I think uh, is, is not a surprise given that he's an actuary, he's the CEO of, and co-founder of, of, of Coterie. He um, knew he wanted to start a company. He wanted to start a company that helped to automate commercial insurance, uh, small commercial especially, because he identified through years of being an actuary, but with kind of an entrepreneurial mindset, that agents aren't really interested in spending a lot of time trying to get the, the best policy or the best deal for small commercial because the commissions just aren't that much. And he's like, so we need to make this as easy as the, as the agent as possible. He had been working for another startup in the insure tech space, clear cover in Chicago, uprooted his family and did a bunch of research to find like, what's the best place to move with a family at that point of three, you know, he's got five care of three with three kids. So five person family, he's now got five kids. Um, he, you know, growing family near insurance talent and where like cost of living was certain, like he had all these different things he was looking for. And he ended up 20 miles from where I sit today and started connecting with people like randomly knew no one here, not randomly, obviously, because he put a lot of effort into it, but knew no one here. No, there wasn't a connection previously. And he started connecting with people in the startup scene. And I was one of them. This is 2018. I had my one month old daughter. He had his three month old son. We both had him in car seats. We sat in the Starbucks in 2018. I was actually there to help vet 
him because a friend of mine was thinking about helping to co-found Coterie. And in a three hour conversation at that Starbucks, he told me all the things that he wanted to do. And I had one response. Why isn't that the way it already is? And he's like, good question. We have 100 to 200 year old, year old companies that are the in legacy industry uh, businesses. That's they have 80% of their businesses renewals. So they just have a, a um, basically a subscription model of that where that, that just you know, get, um, throws cash at them and they have very little incentive to change and all of their technology is 30 to 40 years old. And so changing would be impossible or in, is viewed as, as very expensive. And I said, what? <laughs> and we built in that discussion at three hours, we built and it was most of the vision of, of David, obviously, and his experience in the insurance world. But we built what I was ultimately tapped on the shoulder to come build a few years later. Uh, and that is an automated underwriting engine that, with as little information as business name and address, can go find the data it needs to answer questions. The questions being things that our models have identified they need. Um, and uh, when trying to evaluate likelihood of risk or lifetime value, we do a lot of consideration of the lifetime value um because you're thinking about how long will you have this policy how likely is it that there's a claim at any point during the policy's tenure um all of those things we built model driven and off of thousands of data points um still no telematics though because we're still getting the, the thousand is still, the few thousand is still part of the box score to me um but really trying to figure that out and it was it's it i was reinvigorated in thinking about this problem i loved the consulting world because it was a new problem every day and i so i was reinvigorated from the sports world where it had war it had definitely worn on me um to solving several new problems but in the consulting world you don't usually kind of own the final product or see everything through execution at least in my world i didn't and I wanted to own something or be part of owning something and, and owning decisions more so than an execution and, and the journey. Um, and so this feels a lot like Prediction Machine because every day is a new challenge, but we're still, there's one unified goal and we're all in it. Now it's 150 plus employees, over 100 million, as you alluded to earlier in funding. Um, it's, a, we're all unified, we're all together, we're all building this and every step is a new problem to solve and it's it's been fun to do so very similar to you know starting a company with my brother a decade more than a decade ago that's really cool can i do a couple quick fires sure lebron or jordan lebron brady or manning Ooh. i used to be so firmly in the manning camp but i think brady passed him with the the buccaneers now uh, buccaneers i've done some analysis on this and i think just sheer longevity it of excellence puts Manny on top. But if you're talking game for my life, like I'd rather it was Peyton Manny in his prime than Brady in his prime for one game. Who's the best player in the NBA right now? And why is it Jokic? <laughs> it's Jokic. Um, he's he he's something I, I there is precedent. Will Chamberlain was kind of similar. Um, Wes Enseld actually was kind of similar. It's a it's a it was on solo only at six nine, but he played center. But it's it's a he is so unique because the entire offense and defense. So his when he's on no matter what side of court he's on, the entire team runs through him. And so he can he can do every anything, whatever he thinks is the right thing to do is probably right, first of all. He's a genius, and everything runs through him. Like we've we very, very, very rarely see anything like this. And it's just awesome that he's not the most, most athletic guy in the league. And he, it, but he's so tall, so big, and so smart that everything just runs right through him. He makes the right decisions. Do they repeat? I think they're the favorites. Who's yeah. the best? Good. Who's the, who's the best in the, uh, in the NFL right now? Best player? What team wins the Super Bowl next? Patrick Mahomes is the best player. I actually think that a lot of people are still are obviously talking up the Eagles. We heard the buzz last year around the Bills. I think the Chiefs are still the best team in the NFL. Um, combination of Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, and still a very good defense. 
Um, they give up big plays, but that's because they're on the field so often. Probability would say that they do so. But I think the the Chiefs are most likely to win, so that would be a repeat. Similar with the Nuggets, it's harder to repeat in the NBA than it is um, because it's so every individual player takes on more weight than it is in football, where coaches usually. Um, especially if you have coach and quarterback um, coming back, that's the, those are the biggest pieces to the to the to repeating or to success. What did you think of the merger between Live and PGA? Oh God, <laughs> icky! Um, I thought all of it was gross. Um, I, golf was it was a sport I never predicted, so it was always something I could be a fan of. And then when players like rivalries can be fun you know brooks and bryson was kind of a fun thing for a while but when like it became political and it became and i don't just mean like red blue po- political but it became it, when live ex- when lift started it, 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 like showed the bad side of everybody instead of like you know what what people would prefer out of their entertainment which is the good side of everybody or at least the competitive side of everybody Miocic or John Jones? <laughs> oh, I love your take on this. John Jones is the, is the best fighter of all time. Yeah. But buff, Habib? I mean, pound for pound's a tough thing, but yeah. My take? I don't know. I think in his prime, Miocic might have had it. It's a, it's a little late in the game for that now. We'll you can say happens. that, but it's late in the game for John Jones, too. He just took some He had a few off. years of, uh, of rest. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's we said the same thing. Yeah. No, this is this has been great. Uh, cool. Any parting advice or anything else that you want to discuss or you know mention to the next generation of sports statisticians? Yeah, I mean, I definitely got it through. Um, you know, some of the the things that I or those tweetable nuggets that I thought about before is you know make sure you get the box score right first. Um, always cool. remember the so what. Um, and um and hopefully this was a theme throughout um but you know data without context means nothing um and when i say that it, i mean a lot of different things but one of those is understand the biases that are inherent with the data that you already have make sure you've accounted for that before trying to actually leverage it this was wonderful buddy thank cool. you i appreciate Enjoyed your it. time thanks man see you later see you later.